In the exceptionally cold spring of 1917, the third year of the war, the battlefields were strewn with the frozen bodies of soldiers, yet the brutal fighting relentlessly continued. Nineteen-year-old German Private Henry was hurried by his squad leader into the fray. Comrades who had called out for his help one second were lying in pools of blood the next. He knew the war was meaningless. In these days, the front line had advanced less than a hundred meters with no sight of victory. Every low-ranking soldier was being sent to their death with no other choice but to force themselves forward. At this time, Germany was already at the end of its tether, yet the fervent rhetoric that only by bravely fighting and achieving military feats on the battlefield could Germany become a major power in Europe continued to brainwash the population back home. Paul, a young man who had just come of age, was one of those naive and passionate youths. Influenced by his teacher's glorified portrayal of war, he became increasingly excited, as did all the young people present. They firmly believed that it would only take a few weeks to take Paris. Paul and his childhood friends signed up for the army behind their families' backs, dreaming of victory and a place in history as national heroes admired by all. Little did they know this would be the last moment of dignity in their lives. Yeah! While queuing for military uniforms, Paul noticed the name on the clothes was wrong. It bore the name Henry. An officer efficiently tore off the label, explaining it was returned due to the wrong size for Henry. Paul was unaware that the uniform was actually stripped from a corpse. Henry had recently been killed in action, pulled out from a pile of dead, his uniform removed before he was buried in a mass grave. These blood-stained clothes filled train carriages were sent back home, simply rinsed in large tanks, dried, and sent to factories for minor repairs before being handed back to these unspecting new recruits. They thought they were donning new uniforms, but in reality, they were just being sent to the front lines to become the next victim, the next Henry. After just two days of training, Paul was dispatched to the Western Front in France. The weather there was particularly harsh, cold and damp. His first task was to deal with the water accumulation in the trenches, far from the grand aspirations Paul had for battle. Sent to stand guard in the middle of the night, a boring and difficult task, Paul impulsively fired at a corpse, only for a bullet to whiz back immediately, knocking off his helmet and narrowly missing death. This scared Paul to the core, as just two centimeters lower would have been fatal. But it wasn't over. A flare lit up the night sky and the French army began a bombardment. The new recruits hurried into bomb shelters, their previous Previously proud expressions instantly wiped away. They curled up, shivering, wishing only to go home to their mothers. A soldier, unable to bear the oppressive environment, ran to the entrance of the shelter and was instantly blown into a mist of blood. After continuous heavy bombardment, the bomb shelter was leveled, and the surroundings collapsed into ruins. Paul was lucky to survive, but many were not so fortunate. Seeing the bodies of his classmates in front of him, Paul realized the cruelty of war, but he had no time to grieve. He had to immediately start collecting the dog tags and clothes of the fallen, to be recycled for the new soldiers at the back. The war offered not a single moment of respite, and these young people who should have been in school, struggled to survive their first day on the battlefield let alone become heroes. A year and a half later, the war raged on with the German forces on a continuous decline and no sign of advancement at the front. Paul had become numb and held no hope for victory. In their downtime, he and his comrades would risk their lives to steal a goose from a local farm for a hearty meal together. It was only in these moments that the young soldiers could temporarily escape the gloom of war, relax, and talk about ordinary life, looking forward to the end of the war. Everyone was aware that Germany was on the brink of defeat, which ironically was a good thing as it meant their return home was drawing near. German generals were secretly negotiating an armistice with the Allied powers. However, some pro-war leaders considered a ceasefire agreement a national disgrace, leading to a brief pause in fighting before Paul was sent back to the battlefield. Throw a dog a piece of meat and it will snatch it, give a person a little power and they become savage. Politicians who advocated for war never set foot on the battlefield themselves. They used their power to send low-ranking soldiers into the fray like cogs in a machine, mindlessly charging with bayonets. With just three days left before the end of World War I, the German forces were at a significant disadvantage. Soldiers in the trenches were ready for battle, but they all knew the war was about to end. The German and French were discussing a ceasefire in train carriages, yet the pro-war generals still ordered an attack. At the command Paul and his comrades surged out of the trenches. Amidst the frenzied gunfire and bombings many fell, sacrificing countless lives to advance just a hundred meters seemed utterly pointless. Paul stormed into the French trenches engaging in emotionless killing, yet faced with a handsome young enemy soldier, he hesitated to take his life. A comrade quickly stepped in and fired and they barged into the enemy's kitchen, pausing at the sight of a table full of food. While fierce fighting raged outside they indulged themselves inside. Suddenly the building trembled and swarms of rats emerged. Was it an earthquake? They stepped outside to find the landscape transformed by dust and debris. The French tanks had arrived. With the final stage of World War I, tanks were used on the battlefield for the first time. The advanced steel beasts were impervious to bullets. German formations collapsed under heavy artillery fire and tanks rolled over trenches, crushing soldiers beneath them, causing panic and horrific scenes. An experienced soldier managed to halt a tank with a grenade, momentarily turning the tide. However, the following French troops, armed with flamethrowers, turned the battlefield into a hellish inferno. Paul watched as a former friend was burned alive, his mental defenses utterly shattered. Finally, a retreat was ordered, and everyone fled in desperation, surrounded by flames and water-filled craters. Paul stumbled into a pit and lay motionless on the ground, pretending to be dead to escape the onslaught. But just then, an enemy soldier spotted him from behind. Paul quickly engaged in close combat 
stabbing the enemy several times in the chest before he could finally breathe a sigh of relief. However, the French soldier refused to die easily, and his dying breaths were agonizing for Paul to hear. In that moment Paul suddenly became aware again, his suppressed humanity slowly reawakening. The enemy was just like him, an ordinary person trying to survive. Paul wanted to save him but the man's injuries were too severe and he eventually stopped breathing. From the body Paul found some photos and letters. The Frenchman he had killed had a family of three and was a simple typist. If not for the war he would have lived a peaceful life. Paul collected the letters, promising to make amends for what he had done. <laughs> From regret to self-blame even in hell, Paul managed to retain the kind part of his humanity. Afterwards he walked back to the main camp alone. The soldiers there were all celebrating, having received news that the ceasefire negotiations were nearing an end and they would finally be able to go home. However, one of Paul's old friends, dreaming of becoming a police officer back home, was devastated by a severe leg injury that required amputation to save his life. Unable to accept this reality, he took his own life with a fork to the neck while Paul was not looking. Medical staff were too busy to attend to him, and the soldiers around just coldly watched having grown accustomed to suicide. In this way on the last night of the war Paul lost another friend. He survived the warfare but couldn't withstand the assault on his inner defenses. Almost at the same moment, the Allies officially accepted the surrender terms. Just now, the armistice agreement of World War I was officially signed to take effect at 11 AM. In six hours, the war would end. Early in the morning Paul and his comrade Kate woke up feeling peace and tranquility in the world outside for the first time. They decided decided to steal a goose from a farmer's house to celebrate. Paul climbed the wall and had just grabbed a goose egg when he was spotted by a French farmer. Bullets whizzed by as he ran for his life and they frantically fled. The egg in their pocket broke and to avoid wasting it, they mixed it raw in their mess tin and drank it down, a sour and exhilarating taste. Indeed, Kate went alone into the woods for a moment and turned around to find the farmer's young son following him with a shotgun. Hearing a gunshot, Paul rushed over and found Kate shot in the abdomen. Fortunately, the wound wasn't fatal, and Paul helped him walk slowly back to the base. As they walked, a friendly vehicle passed by, its soldiers cheering loudly, paying no attention to stopping. Seeing Kate growing weaker, Paul had no choice but to carry him all the way back. They finally reached the medical room, but the doctor said Kate had already passed away. Hearing this news was unbearable for Paul. They were just one step away from home, and a moment ago his fellow countryman was alive and talking and now he lay dead. But whom could they blame for this? The rest of the soldiers weren't much luckier. In a final act of madness, the generals ordered an attack in the last hour before the ceasefire for their so-called pride and honor. We erobern die Ebene noch vor 11 Uhr und beenden diesen Krieg mit einem Sieg. Upon hearing the selfish orders from their superiors, the soldiers were naturally resistant. But those who led the opposition were immediately taken aside and executed by firing squad. The rest of the soldiers had no choice but to head to the front lines again. With only 15 minutes left until the end of the war, Paul charged forward with his squad indifferent. The French army, already celebrating with wine, was caught off guard by this attack, scrambling to arm themselves only upon hearing the approaching footsteps. Once again, the German forces made a costly advance into French territory, with Paul killing enemy soldiers mechanically like a heartless war machine. However, he soon encountered a formidable opponent, narrowly escaping death several times during their struggle. Struggle, which ended with both of them falling into a bomb shelter. Upon standing, there seemed to be an unspoken agreement between them to hold off until 11 AM to end the fight. Unexpectedly, Paul was stabbed through the heart just as the clock struck 11, marking the official end of the war. The enemy soldier glanced at Paul, then silently walked away. Paul, with great difficulty, slowly emerged from the bomb shelter. The air was still thick with gun smoke, but the soldiers from both sides had ceased fire. World War I was over, and the remaining soldiers busied themselves collecting the dog tags of their recently deceased comrades. And so, Paul's young life was forever halted at this moment. The loss of an individual life is trivial and barely known in the grand narrative of human history. Ironically, the war report in Germany that day stated, all quiet on the Western Front. In 1928, Eric Maria Remarque, a German veteran of the front lines, published a novel based on his real-life experiences. The book, devoid of grand war scenes and focusing instead on the cruel and dirty reality of death, became a global sensation upon its release. Just a few years later, Germans were once again brainwashed by the fervor of war, driven by absurd passions to replicate past glories marching into the battlefield of World War II. This meaningless cycle of repetition, like the clothes and dog tags collected and reused in the movie, erases the value of individual lives, reducing them to expendable materials in the war machine, less valuable than scraps of fabric and metal. All the lower-ranking soldiers could do was kill each other, their physical deaths merely barbaric bargaining chips at the negotiation table. Tragically, nearly 17 million people died in World War I, and World War II multiplied that number several times over, devastating countless families in an instant. All Quiet on the Western Front tells the story of an entire generation sacrificed, and the lesson we must learn from it is that nothing is more important than cherishing peace. Thanks for watching. Make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you can watch more videos like this.